Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Oliver Medvedic. I'm, uh, well, right now, currently, I'm a professor at a small university in New York City, Cooper Union. So I work in the bioengineering department there. And before that, I was a co-founder of Genspace, which is a community biotech lab. And along with Keith Comito here, we then co-founded Lifespan.io. So my interest in aging goes back kind of a long way. So I did my PhD with Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard University. And I've been sort of out of the aging field for a while. I've been out on the periphery observing this. But nevertheless, this is something that drew me to science initially, because it's such a fundamental thing that can be answered finally with the tools that we have at our disposal. So I'm going to be talking about some of these tools that we have. Um, I'm going to try to ground this in um, tools that we have available now. And also, just going out of a little bit out of the, the context of the talk, as Damien said, I'll talk a little bit about gene therapy. But mainly, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that are used in gene therapy, such as CRISPR-Cas9, and basically what it is and how it works. So I hope this doesn't devolve into a total lecture, because I give those a lot in university. Uh, but I'm also going to be talking about some of the technologies that are outside of gene therapy that are currently being utilized uh, to affect positively lifespan, and where I think this is going, and what are going to be some of the, the early uh, tools that we'll see therapies coming about. So this is sort of the coolest picture I could find of CRISPR and Cas9 in action on the internet. And I guess everybody's asking CRISPR, will it cure aging? I mean, the, the answer to that for me is maybe, right? So yes or no, maybe. Um, it's a tool. It's got its limitations. And I think it has its purpose in, in this. Uh, but we've got to basically ground ourselves in its limitations. So I'm going to just kind of quickly overview and um, discuss uh, how we're going to use it. So there's been a lot of you know, talk about controversies, whether it's going to destroy us or save us. Certainly, the scientific magazines, Science and Nature, are not above this type of uh, whipping up a frenzy about CRISPR and Cas9, seek and destroy, targeted destruction. Uh, you can go online. You can get these tools, um, these plasmids, on companies such as AdGene for easy genome editing. So these tools could be used at community biotech labs like Genspace, which I work at, and I teach a CRISPR class there. So basically, people come in from the public, and they learn how to use these technologies, and they actually apply them to uh, uh, engineering genes in an organism, in our case, yeast. So just to run through giving everybody a background, because I'm going to assume here you don't, some of you or most of you don't know exactly how this tool works. Those of you who do or are experts, please bear with me. But I'm just going to give you a very fast overview over my view of biotechnology. So biotech basically started in the 1970s. And we've been using these tools called restriction endonucleases, which chop DNA up. But they do it in, in vivo. That's one of the problems, limitations. We still use them. But we can't really use them in organisms. And we can only use it in discrete locations. So we have to use this in test tubes. We have to use it to chop up DNA, splice it, put it back in the organism. So very slow. Um, been discovered in the 70s, but we still work with it. In the late 80s, site-specific recombinase technologies came into being. Uh, and these are technologies that use enzymes uh, that are a little bit more sophisticated than the restriction enzymes. They don't just cut DNA, but they can cut DNA and essentially loop pieces out. So if you make organisms that have something integrated at one location that are flanked by specific sequences, and you have another organism, another mouse that's making this enzyme, if you cross these mice, you can have this location basically modified. So these are basically used in the field of transgenics, in transgenic mice. So you could use this technology to see what happens if you switch a certain gene on or off in different cells. So it's a very powerful tool, but still there's a limitation. This cutting only happens in one location. So with that, in 1990s to now, uh, the development has been using programmable endonucleases. So just like um, the restriction enzymes, these things cut. So an endonuclease is an enzyme that just cuts DNA. So everything we've been talking about is just cutting DNA, just cutting it at specific locations. And these zinc finger nucleases and tailins, which stands for transcription activator-like endonucleases, are basically what are referred to in the field as fusion proteins. So they're not naturally found, unlike restriction enzymes. But in this case, you take a, a one enzyme and you hook it up to modules that recognize different parts of the genome. So you can custom design these to cut wherever you want in the genome. 
So this is great. Um, the only issue is that you know these are patented. There's companies that use them, but even if they weren't patented, it's still really tricky to do protein design. So you have to design one. It takes weeks, months, and uh, then apply it. So that's where CRISPR comes in. So CRISPR um, really simplified the cutting of DNA. So really all of biotechnology, most of it's been cutting DNA at a, a particular location. And that's all CRISPR does. It just cuts, cr cuts at one location very well, very specifically, um, with almost 0% off-target cutting at this point. So what's CRISPR? Well, CRISPR stands for uh, Clustered Regularly Interspersed Palindromic Repeats. That's a long name. Um, and it's basically um, a protein that interacts with an RNA. An RNA is another little molecule that's like DNA. And this complex then homes in on different locations. And the cool thing about CRISPR is the part that does the homing is the RNA. Well, you're probably asking, so what? Why not just make it a protein and go there? Well, the really cool thing is RNA and nucleic acids are really easy to work with. Any lab can basically um, manufacture these nucleic acids very readily or outsource them to companies that'll do that for you for a few bucks. So this is, that's really what led to why CRISPR is exploding is because everybody can custom design endonucleases now to cut wherever they want really simply and really cheaply. So what CRISPR is, and just like the other enzymes I talked about, this all came from nature. So every tool that we use is basically coming from nature and we repurpose it just like every other tool. So if we look at the phylogenetic tree of life, the three major domains, bacteria, archaea, eukarya, these two used to be clumped together, uh, but now they're found to be genetically distinct. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system is found in about 40% of bacteria and 90% of archaea. Not, I don't think anybody's discovered any in eukarya, which is us, like animals and plants. Um, so what does CRISPR do in the natural world? Well, this is to me, even cooler than using it as a tool. This is basically comes through basic science. It's a bacterial acquired immune system. So until 2010, 2009, um, if you were to ask somebody, does any organism that's beyond uh, an advanced organism like a lizard or a bird or a human have an acquired immune system, the answer would be no. If you open up any biological textbook that came out, you know, like maybe the last edition of, of molecular cell biology or two editions ago, um, this is not going to be in it, right? They're just going to say flat out in the immuno immunology section. It doesn't, they won't even say that bacteria don't have an immune system because there's nothing to say. Everybody knows that it doesn't have an immune system, but it does. And the cool thing about this is that essentially the way this immune system works is it has a a record of the DNA of viruses that infect the bacteria, and they put it into the genome of the um, organism, in this case the bacteria, and this array basically is like a database, a viral database of viruses that recently infected the bacteria, and these little bits of DNA are converted to RNAs, these things called guide RNAs, which then, when they bind to the Cas protein, which is made by the bacteria, this guide RNA specifies where this Cas is going to go and do the cutting, in this case, to the viral genome. And like viral databases on your laptop, this is also continuously updated. So the old sequences come off, the new sequences come in, um, because the bacteria only has a limited space to push all this information. So this stuff has been engineered by nature billions of years ago, right? So this, this is the, the original antiviral software, literally. So that's not even an analogy. So I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this is just a timeline of how long this has been in development. And from the 19, late 80s to 90s, I'm just gonna say that these weird sequences were found uh, using high throughput genomic sequencing. When they compared bacterial sequences, they noticed this CRISPR thing popping up over and over and over and again. Um, and it took a while before somebody said, aha, and this was this fellow Mojica and his lab, and they suggested it might be a bacteriological immune system. And then later, laboratories around 2010, uh, Carpentier and Doudna and Zhang Lab, they basically started to use this technology as a tool, you basically making a tool out of it. And this is where really we've been seeing the explosion of where everybody's been talking about CRISPR here. They've been talking about it as an application rather than the original, you know, really cool discovery of what it does in nature. So just briefly, um, you've got the protein, you've got this RNA, they come together to form a complex, they find, they home in on a, on a piece of DNA, and these blobs of the protein 
basically do the cutting. So this little X here and X here are two cuts on the DNA. And it basically just makes a cut through DNA. That's it, very precisely. And since then, people have been making all sorts of variants of Cas9, different Cas species. I'm just using that term loosely, different proteins. So not only there are there different naturally occurring Cas9s, but there's also modified ones that recognize things called proto space or adjacent motifs. Uh, I just said it now, and I'll forget it because I'm not going to refer to it now again. But suffice it to say, you have all these variants. And how is Cas9 to be used in gene therapy? Well, when you put a break in DNA, that's a bad thing generally. Um, if you do it in, in cells randomly in your body, that's associated with mutations. Um, some places you want them to happen, like the immune system, but most places you don't. So the cell wants to repair it really quickly. And the way it does so is two mechanisms. One I'm not going to go over. It's called an HEJ, non-homology end joining. That's like a quick and dirty way to repair, but it makes errors. Another way is homology-directed repair. And this uses a template to copy off of and basically fix itself so it makes a precise repair. And this is the system that you can subvert to try to sneak in something of your interest. So how would this be used um, in, in anti-aging or aging therapeutic context? Um, well, this is just one paper of many, meta-analysis of genetic variants associated with human exceptional longevity. So people are, because of high throughput sequencing, everybody's looking for what's the difference between a supercentenarian and the rest of us. So all of these different changes, basically, so some people have more efficient enzymes and so on and so forth. So recently, CRISPR-Cas9 was used as a genome editing tool for correcting this, uh, these dystrophin mutations. Um, and they used a technique of CRISPR called multiplexing, where you can express many of these guide RNAs and do several different lots, in this case, about 20 changes all at once um, to fix a genetic locus. So it's easy for me to envision that you can use this technology to modify stem cells and improve them and before you put them back into the patient. Um, it would be probably a lot of multiplexing involved, um, depending on how many locations we're looking at. So that's, that's kind of like the, the, I guess, the fundamental aspect of, of gene therapy and genetic engineering, but there's a, there's a lighter side to it in that you've all heard of the genome, and some of you have probably heard of the epigenome. So genetic language has, has many hierarchies. And DNA is not just found in a long string, but it's wound up in these three-dimensional hierarchical organizations. And in order for things to be read, they have to be unwound, right, and rewound. So you have this three-dimensionality that has to be traversed by all the enzymes. And how genes are accessed depends on how it's packed. So there are certain chemical modifications that are put onto the genome, either on these little, look like meatballs here, but these meatballs are histones. So if you put certain chemical groups on these, uh, these um, nucleosomes, uh, they, can un they can unwind the DNA or cause it to compact. Likewise, you can put modifications on DNA. This is chemical language that we are only just beginning to understand. Right now, we know like four or five different modifications, but I spoke to Chris Mason, who works at Cornell, and he studies this, and he said, we found up to 50 different chemical groups, and we don't know what most of them do. So that just gives you a, a taste of how, how new this stuff is. So um, I call this a wee bit of Lamarck because um, You've seen a few slides later that these epigenetic modifications are influenced environmentally, yet they are inherited. So one type of modification that you'll hear a lot of when you read the literature are these um, what are called CPG islands. These are just C's and G's, which are just the two letters of the four-letter alphabet of the DNA. And you can have these little chemical groups called methyls attached uh, to particular uh, nucleotides. And where you have a lot of methyl groups, the DNA is enclosed up and you can't be read, or if it's unmethylated, it's opened up. So the methylation status determines how a cell reads um, its DNA. It's like the file cabinet is open or file cabinet is closed. And that's how all the cells of your body, um, that's how they're differentiated for the most part. You all have, for the most part, the same genome. But because different regions have different methylation patterns and lots of other epigenetic patterns, the initial cell, the zygote, as it de develops through, uh, through uh, development, uh, will develop into 200 plus different cell types or somatic um, adult stem cells throughout your body to make the different tissues, right? So this is all through epigenetic modifications. And for the most part, these changes, you want, to, you want them to stay 
the same throughout your life. You don't want them to kind of change around, right? You don't want your neuron to turn into a, to a muscle cell, or you, know, you, want, you want it to kind of stay around, stay around in the way it is. But unfortunately, these epigenetic modifications could also change or mutate. So just like mutations in, in DNA, which is sort of in, its, in, the, in the hard code, you can get changes in the epigenetic status, and genes are turned on that shouldn't be turned on, right? So, and that's, that's been seen in aging. So this is just a slide from a paper which shows that these epigenetic changes can also be um, hereditarily passed on. So um, certain uh, environmental factors like diet can affect uh, the passing on of methylation patterns to um, offspring. So that's why I called it Lamarck light. So those of you who read about Lamarckianism, yes, the environment can potentially you know, pass on changes in, in a certain context in this case. So these epigenetic changes, these, when you look at different regions of the epigenome, um, they vary. They start to, you know, you start to get um, the methylation patterns change as somebody gets older, and this can correlate with healthier cells or uh, younger cells. And you can actually estimate, you know, how healthy or young a cell is by looking at some of these epigenetic modifications. Uh, the way it connects the CRISPR is that CRISPR isn't just used for cutting, it's just really a, such a flexible tool that um, you can do something, you can basically, all CRISPR does, I just mentioned it cuts, but cuts it at specific locations and that RNA takes it to that location. But what if the CRISPR didn't cut at that location? Well, the RNA would still bring the CRISPR, I mean, the Cas9 protein over. It just wouldn't be functional. Uh, this one is just called D-Cas9. D stands for dead Cas9. They just mutated the endonuclease port part. So it goes there and it does nothing. But if you design it to attach to a different protein, in this case, they used uh, a methyl transferase, you can home in this CRISPR to different locations and have it alter the epigenome at different sites. Um, so you can basically stick on whatever enzyme you want. You can have it acetylate a site or deacetylate a site or whatever. So now you have this toolkit with CRISPR-Cas9. You can go and go to sites and cut them, and with the right template, you can change either the hard genetic code or the slightly, I'll call it softer genetic code of the epigenome and modify it. So we have this now tool at our disposal to do those changes. But there's probably going to be a lot of changes. And, and one critical problem is accessibility, getting it to, to where it needs to go in all these locations. So um, that's where we're at with basically with CRISPR. And it's, the story is still evolving. It's still basically um, more variants are being built, more applications are being designed. And uh, with this, I want to take you now kind of just to move on to a, a different approach that's being applied a little earlier uh, to treatment of uh, aging-like effects, um, you know, uh, cells that don't, um, don't perform metabolically the way they should perform. And I'm just going to throw out a term here that I sort of invented. I'll call it augmentives, a softer touch. Uh, we all take supplements, or some of us take supplements, vitamins. Um, when you say supplement, to me, it sounds like a dietary supplement, like you're taking something you're lacking in your, in your diet. Um, I just said, well, let me call these augmentives, because this isn't really, you don't need them in your diet, but your body is depleted of them as it grows older. Cells that need to make certain things don't make them anymore. Right. Some small molecules can enter into the cells and basically boost the activity of enzymes that are now faltering. So you have small molecules like resveratrol, terastilbene, nicotinamide, riboside, rapamycin. A lot of you have heard of these molecules that affect TOR and sirtuins. There's also biologics, which are larger things like proteins. GDF11, parabiosis experiments. Um, this is a factor that influences muscle growth, IL-33. It's been some really impressive studies done with mice showing the reversal of um, Alzheimer's in an Alzheimer's mouse model. So beta amyloid plaques were being cleared using this, um, this IL-33, which also drops down and decreases with patients that have Alzheimer's. So a company out there, Elysium, which was founded by um, Lenny Garenti, who's a former PI of David Sinclair. Um, you can get nicotinamide riboside and terastilbene uh, now at the market. And what they do is basically they affect SIRT1, which is an enzyme that basically um, accelerates the deacetylation of those meatballs, the histones, and that affects the epigenetic status of certain genes. So here we have now a chemical modulation of the epigenetic status. Um, and that's already at the market, still you know, being worked on. As far, the, as far as the biologics are concerned, GDF11, 
Uh, this result, as I mentioned, came from a parabiosis study by Amy Wagers at Harvard. And this is where they, this is to me Frankensteinian science at its finest. Um, two mice were basically had their vascular systems connected, an old mouse and a young mouse. So you had the blood rejuvenating another mouse, right? So um, sort of a Countess Bathory type of thing taking place here. Um, the question is, well, what's going on here, right? I mean, what's, what is rejuvenating what? And one uh, such molecule was discovered, GDF11, which is uh, a protein that basically declines with age um, and is required for muscle stem cells to differentiate. Another class of, of uh, molecules that are therapeutics, um, and this is a class of its own, and this is really something really new that just came out, um, is uh, primarily work done at the Campisi lab, are senolytics. And these are really interesting molecules. A lot of them have been repurposed from cancer drugs, so drugs that basically cause cells to die, if, or apoptose, technically, um, if, they're, if they're expressing the wrong proteins. And these things are found to uh, kill off senescent cells. And when cells basically proliferate in the body, right, so they'll divide, 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 they'll eventually, some of them will wear out, they'll senesce, they'll stop dividing, and they'll not immediately apoptose, but they'll sort of linger and release these inflammatory chemicals and basically wreck the neighborhood of the other cells. So these, um, these senolytics target um, the, the pathways that are on in these senescent cells, and they basically ablate them. Right, so it basically gets rid of these negative stimuli. And this is a really cool technology because um, it's probably going to be very important. You know, people talk about stem cell replacements, getting stem cells out, processing them basically, such as using maybe CRISPR-Cas9 to modify them, then reinfusing them. But if the environment is bad, um, these stem cells are going to malfunction. So having senolytics on hand will potentially go hand in hand with this type of treatment. So, that's where I see, you know, this is sort of all the most recent technologies and the ones that are, are to me, the most well-developed. Um, there's going to be, there are a lot more that I haven't talked about and that some of the speakers will. But um, I want to sort of project now a little bit as to how I see these working. Uh, so this is a statistical history of human lifespan. So this is our normal lifespan. This is a Gompertz curve. This is 100% of things or humans are alive here. This is our maximal age, 125, give or take. And this is our average lifespan in the wild. This is when we're taken care of by Mother Nature. We die off at 35. So thanks, Mom. So when we have civilization, we have improved safety and diets so and no predation taking place. We shift this. The average lifespan shifts. So people still died at a, you know, people still lived long. This is just an average, right? So people in ancient Greece still could go up to 100, 125, but most of them didn't because most of them got, you know, shot by an arrow and got an infection and there's no antibiotic. So the average drops. Um, so we have a safer environment, better diet. And this has been shifting continuously. Medications like antibiotics. But as you can see here, this maximal isn't moving. You're basically pushing this. And there's a limit to how far you can push this until you get to this point. And for most people, this is enough. So I can imagine lifespans, if you put, use these augmentives and senolytics, um, you'll maximize all the cells that you have basically make them as healthy, as efficient they are until the stem cells are mostly depleted and you basically drop dead uh, because of organ failure. Maybe that's the best way to go. But the question is, you know, can we do this? Can we basically just take this curve and just keep going? And there's no physical reason why we can't. So I can imagine certainly if we have stem cell replacements and certainly stem cell replacements that have been um, modified using, let's say, maybe a CRISPR system where you have stem cells that are, have been improved to be the best stem cells, representative of perhaps somebody who has stem cells of a super centenarian, um, and you start taking some sort of augmentives uh, and you infuse them back, you can potentially just keep doing that and just have that basically go on and on and on. So that's... That's my speculation there. So there are challenges, obviously, to overcome. What should we be doing to kind of keep the ball rolling in this direction? Um, so what I think is that we definitely need to identify and better characterize adult stem cells. So we have over 200 plus different cell types. What is it about a stem cell that makes a stem cell, right? So right now, it's just a characterization. You just have a parts list. If it does all these things, then it's a stem cell, right? We don't have anything. There's no mathematical proof of a stem cell, right? You just have this list. So um, that's the best we can do. So if we can characterize which 
cancer, the stem cells, those are the ones we could target for therapy. Improved vectors for more effective gene therapy delivery. So I've been just talking about the therapy itself, but how do you get the therapy there? People use modified viruses and they have limitations, such as how much information you can pack into them. So we have to improve vectors for how we get this stuff delivered. Um, identification of epigenetic states correlated with aging. Um, that's ongoing. We have to compare one population to another population. So what are all those epigenetic differences and what are they doing? And of course, identification of alleles or different types of uh, point mutations or changes in the DNA that correlate with increased longevity. So we can basically then apply that to a gene therapeutic approach. And of course, more and better screens um, to identify newer and better augmentative and senolytic candidates. Uh, and one such screen we're basically funding, or have funded, at, uh, Lifespan.io successfully, and more and better clinical trials, and I'm gonna put this in parentheses, open source to characterize additional augmentives, because I think for, we're, you know, most of us here are impatient, and you know, at least in the United States, you've got the FDA, and if we do things the typical way, every single one of these compounds is gonna cost about a half a billion dollars and take 10 years to develop, so we'll be long dead before we can you know, rejuvenate ourselves, and that's clearly not workable. So, um, Things are moving in that direction, I think. Um, some of you have heard about the Apple Research Kit, which basically allows um, people to sort of outsource um, a, a clinical type trial and basically become both the experimenter and the data point itself, right? So, um, and then that data can then be accessed by everybody wor else working in the field and that can potentially accelerate um, the discovery of, of such compounds. So to sum up, more basic research is definitely needed. Uh, in my opinion, we, we still don't have a solid theoretical understanding of aging and longevity. We do know enough to start implementing a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of the results that we have. So with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, okay. Uh, so uh, the question is that uh, I know that now there is also one thing, CPF1, that is quite popular and some people think that it may be even better than CRISPR. Maybe you can explain uh, uh, in what cases CP CPF1 is more promising and in, in, and in what cases not and uh, well, basically your opinion about this. Yeah, so I believe, so, I, so we're going a little bit in the rabbit hole with, with, uh, with um with CRISPR and Cas9, CPF1 is is from a so um, Cas9 Cas9 is from a the the S pyogenes is this one type of um, bacteria that they that it's been isolated. But lots of, like I mentioned, lots of other bacteria have different types of CRISPR systems, and CPF1 is one of them. And I believe one advantage is that it's much smaller, and it's more so if it's smaller, um, you can pack it in better into a, in a vector. So like, let's say if you use a virus, like an adenovirus, there's a limit to how much stuff you can pack in so to deliver to a cell. And one thing that people are trying to overcome is trying to get as much of the Cas9 information loaded into the genome as possible. So CPF1 is, I believe, even smaller, so it, it's more efficient in that, in that way. So, yeah. There might be other advantages, but that's, that's the one I know, know of. Um, do you have any uh, evidence or you know anything about the acceleration of uh, uh, the accumulation of senescent cells in people with uh, either an autoimmune disease or a very unhealthy lifestyle and uh, things like that? Well, yeah, certainly if, if, if there's a lot of stress to an organism, um, senescent cells will accumulate, uh, accumulate, I believe, if you take certain toxins like chemotherapeutics, for example. Um, Keith and I were recently, or a while ago, at a conference which basically tried to really kind of broaden the horizons of what it mean, means but to age, right? So if you look at a lot of diseases, in some way you can consider things that you don't normally consider to be aging to maybe fall under that umbrella by having cells sort of hypersenesce until you deplete them, like being infected with the HIV, basically. Your, your immune system has to keep replicating more um, helper T cells over and over and over again, and there's a limitation um, to how many times these somatic stem cells can replicate, and that's something that I don't think anybody really knows what, what are the exact barriers to overcome in that continual replication of the somatic stem cells, but suffice it to say, they, they run out, um, and then, 
that organ, that part of the organ is gone, depleted, right? So um, different parts of your, different organs could, could actually senesce or get old at different rates as a result, depending on where the damage accumulates and at what rate. Does that answer the question partly? All right. Thank you. Um, my question would be, um, is it possible to look at a person's genome, a young person, and create basically a backup of the data, and then as the person ages and the genome degrades, that you just like put the old stuff in there as a backup with CRISPR or a similar technology? Uh, right now, that sounds like an excellent idea, actually. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody's doing that. That's like, that's, that's could be a really good idea. It's like the data equivalent of, of, of having your um, umbil umbilical stem cells um, frozen, right? So then, then you can try, in this case, you're just, you're just saving the epigenetic data rather than the stem cells themselves. But the problem is that we will have to make samples from many places. We cannot just make one sample of our epigenetics. So it can cost quite a lot to... That's true. But perhaps we can develop them in vitro and then see how what, what changes happen if you have a if you have basically like a the human on the chip model where you can do induced pluripotent stem cells and artificially make them into neurons then see hopefully the epigenetic genome of that will be correct hopefully <laughs> that hasn't been done yet yet also all right um i don't really need a mic i think all right um, just you've raised an interesting question on a good business model with somebody who had his uh son's uh stem cell his cord blood stored frozen some 12 years ago. Could you take that cord blood and make the kind of, um, the kind of model that Damien was just uh, saying? In other words, are there people out there right now who can take advantage of that and store cord blood? I would say sure. Yeah. Keith. Uh, not really a question, but I want to kind of piggyback on that because actually Oliver, I have talked about um, you can actually potentially go above and beyond this at some point uh, if we get much more sophisticated information uh, with companies like uh, Human Longevity uh, that are trying to uh, find out the DNA that that maps to super super centenarians and stuff. You might be able to at some point take someone who's already old, take their cell, you know, uh, sequence it and with mathematics sort of come up with the better version of that person's sequence, make those cells, then give them a stem cell infusion with that. So that's down the road, but like, I would love to see like a stem cell bank like that down the road. And we have sort of talked to Sloan Kettering a little bit about that idea. Down the road. <laughs> Any other questions? So there are uh, some of these augmentative molecules that are, that are available right now. Uh, that are known to uh, protect stem cell populations, uh, I think mostly through antioxidant mechanisms and then uh, and anti-inflammatory mechanisms. And then what you see is that uh, the organism gets more differentiating stem cells out of it. That uh, uh, would that mean? Uh, you just said that uh, the stem cells can only divide so often. Would that mean that? taking these things and getting more of this new cell influx that you're wearing yourself out faster or? Yeah, I haven't looked at that data, but I'm, question, answer is unfortunately for me, I don't know. Um, it, could, it could be that um, the cells, as, so as when the stem cells divide, they, they asymmetrically divide. One becomes a stem cell state, remains a stem cell, the other ones come differentiated. And, there are other mechanisms at play that you know cause certain damaged materials to stay in one cell versus another cell, and I don't know how those molecules would affect that system. So uh, whether that would lead to eventual depletion, um, I don't know. Certainly, the, the the mouse models out there suggest not because you give them these compounds and they live longer and better. So, um, but I don't know if anybody's actually counted them, you know. So. Those are other experiments that need to be done. All right, thank you very much.